have a background in electrical engineering. Um, I'm an electrical engineer by training. Uh, I did my PhD in uh, wireless communication um, in multi-user NEMA uh, from the University of New South Wales in 2012. And I was uh, supervised by Jin Hong, who is here uh, in calling and Daniel Wayan. I did, I did some, uh, some work in, in industry uh, as well at Broadcom Corporation for about six months, developing physical layer, uh, wireless, uh, uh, wireless algorithms. Uh, uh, so, but then I moved into, uh, into neurosciences and that's what I'm going to uh, talk about today, introduce you to uh, some of the basics of uh, what I have learned over the past few years. After uh, finishing, uh, after my finishing my PhD in a bit of a industrial work, I moved to University College London, where I spent about six years uh, learning about um, computational neuroscience and neuroimaging. Okay, so that's uh, so so let's start, and and before I go into much of uh, the details, I would say that I will keep it uh, somewhat very high level. Um, and I know this that this this community loves maths, and there's as much maths as you like. You can you can bring it in. But I will try to keep it simple. Try to give uh, an introduction to what what are the important problems. What's uh, how one can um, you know if interested start in this area, uh, or at least uh, you know know a bit basics of it. Okay, so let's start. So. Um, so what we do, so in my lab, um, we, 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 as, uh, we, we work at the interface of neuroscience and machine learning and, and engineering. Um, and what we do is to model brain dynamics and the dynamics of brain networks. And how do we do that is by using a multidisciplinary approach, which is to use uh, which is to use multimodal mirror imaging. So first of all, we should be able to image or acquire with signals, which we can then uh, use as an empirical data to test our models. So for this, we use mirror imaging. Uh, I will talk about it, uh, a bit basics of it again, uh, using MRI. Uh, then we develop models, uh, which uh, burrow, uh, frameworks for machine learning and artificial intelligence uh, uh, and probabilistic modeling. Uh, then we also use some what, what we call statistical tools from Bay of Bayes and inference. And we also use um, quite a bit of uh, uh, tools from physics, for example, dynamical systems. Uh, brain itself, we, we model as a dynamical system which changes over time. And that for this, lots of physics is useful. Okay, so, um, so, so this is the agenda for today. So I will give a bit of an introduction um, to the system of interest of brain initially. Uh, then I'll talk about basics of brain imaging, how one, one can measure brain signals. Then I will give, give one complete example of, of dynamic causal modeling. And then, and then I will uh, try to give a very quick introduction to active inference and free energy principle um, uh, towards the end. Let's see how far we can go. Okay, so uh, let's um, go into more details. So, um, so here, what we are talking about is how does the brain give rise to experience, thought, and behavior, or in general, how does the consciousness arise from, uh, from, uh, 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 from neurons, which are many, uh, there are billions of neurons in the brain, but if you look at them, they are just nothing but uh, chemicals, for example, uh, interaction of potassium and, and, and magnesium and so on. So how does the consciousness arise from this? Yeah. So, one perspective is this, that this arises from interaction of these neurons. And, and this is what we call functional interact, uh, fun, functional integration. So one, one, uh, one perspective on brain is this, that, that uh, and which we call phrenology, which is that 
uh, and, and which was in early 1800s and 1900s that that some parts of the brain have have a specific function for example uh, some parts of the brain would have um, um, uh, just a second okay so so some parts of the brain would be for thinking some parts of the brain would be about language some part of the brain would be about about uh, uh, about seeing and things and so on and so forth but the modern perspective is this that that that, that none of these brain parts they actually exist or do function in isolation but rather they interact and they interact and and these interactions are very complex and from these in, uh, and in this sense we can think of brain as a complex network yeah and and and, the, and and these complex interactions are what from which the consciousness or different experiences thoughts and behaviors arise um so um so if so, so here what i'm showing you is, is these are hand drawn um white uh, drawings from Kajal. so it is from 1900 from from uh, from 19th century where where he has drawn these uh, neural architectures or what we call cyto architectures where these are columns of neurons and this is how they are organized and they are about there are as i said hundreds of billions of neurons and each neuron synapses about 10000 times yeah so if you if you can connect all these neurons and synapses you can actually go back to the moon and come back so that's the length of the connectivity that's present in the brain and then so this means there are about 10 to power 30 computing elements which are capable of propagating signals at, at 10 to 100 times per second so it's a massively complex system so one could one could ask that how one could start with with analyzing and understanding such a complex system. So for this, I will give you an example, an example from 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 wireless system. So think think of a of a wireless system which is also a hierarchical system or a, or, or a, a, it exists at different scales. So for example, uh, you know a transistor and an NPN junction. You you bring them together you get get what we call you know an operational amplifier several several of these uh bipolar engine transistors there uh, then from this one can get a chip board with multiple chips on this which are and then from these comes the wireless network so one could look at this as a system which is hierarchical and works at different scales and each of them has its own clock yeah from microseconds or nanoseconds to 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 minutes or to years yeah Similarly, uh, and probably these these artificial systems, they are more are motivated or inspired by biological systems. And then, and if you look at the brain, so so one could see there's a you know the the very basic uh, the basic element the genes or the brain cells which we call neurons they they combine together give you a psycho architecture which I was showing before. Then, uh, then many of these connect together to give an, to give up a, a, a another level of brain uh, networks and connectivity, and that's where I will, and this is where I will focus today. Then these results in in brains, and then 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 and and then of course populations and behaviors, and of course they are disorders. So one could look at one can look at them at many different temporal and spatial scales. Yeah. So this is how we are going to. So this, so, so a neuroscientist is probably as as big as as engineer. There are many different sub disciplines within neuroscience. Uh, for example, from molecular and solid cellular neuroscience to system neuroscience. Um, so this is how we are going to uh, proceed. We will look at the brain at different. Um, different scales and the scale that we will be interested in would be at the level of, for example, at the level of brain regions where each region will have millions of neurons, but we will consider them as a, as a, as an homogeneous, uh, uh region, uh, having a homogeneous set of neurons, which have certain function. And then several of those regions work together to give networks and networks turn into, into, into organs and so on, so on and so forth. 
Okay, so uh, before I go into this, I, I'll just give you an example from uh, from uh, what we uh, uh, say nowadays a very um, you, a very big field in 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 machine learning and and and, and deep learning. So if you look at deep learning, the basic is the basic building block is an artificial neural neuron, which is which is just nothing but, uh, but you know, you can build this with, a, with an operational amplifier that I, I, I showed you before. It's just some input, there's some non-linearity, yeah? And then some output, yeah? And this is like a sigmoid function. Um, and this is a building block, just like a neuron, for example, a biological neuron. Then you can bring these together, many of them. You can make an input layer, you can an output layer, and you have a hidden layer. Yeah, and this is something which has been there for neural well, networks are not new. They have been there for, for half a century now. Um, and, and these are early architectures, but these days one can do uh, is in past 10 years. So one can actually increase the number of hidden layers. Um, and, and, and then these becomes a very, very powerful tool, yeah. For example, uh, you know, the, the first layer will, will identify the edges, the other layers will, will identify combination of these edges and then features and so on and so forth. And one can then detect what's, what's there in the picture, yeah. So, uh, I mean, uh, so, so why, while we, we know that uh, deep learning and machine learning is making huge strides these days, and almost everything that we can think of uh, is now, uh, you know, uh, deep learning and machine learning has been applied, yeah? So what are the parallels between these two? So, um, so, so what are the parallels between the biological network that the brains are and, and for example, the artificial neural network that I was talking about? So, uh, here I'm, I'm on, on, on this panel, what I have is a brain with certain brain regions that I was talking about, which where each brain region will have uh, millions of neurons in them. Uh, we, we measure these, uh, we measure brain, and I'll talk about a bit later on. Uh, from each brain region, we, we, uh, we measure some activity. So these are the time series. From these time series, for example, we can calculate correlations or the similarity matrices, which we get here. And from these, we can make functional brain net networks. Similarly, like in, in artificial neural network, as I was saying, there is a artificial neuron. They can connect together to give a, a large neural network. And these can be trained, for example, to, to uh, the, one can you know, uh, train them to uh, to get, for example, a, 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 a picture of dog can be given and it can say, okay, that's dog, yeah? So the parallels is this, that while one can use artificial neural networks and artificial neural not, uh, uh, neuron, one can actually try to make biophysical models of the actual neurons as well, yeah? And for this exists Quite a quite a uh, quite a, a variety of of uh, of uh, of network of of of, um, of ways one can one can model these uh, individual neurons. For example, Hodgkin Huxley uh, model for which they got the Nobel Prize. Um, then then one can connect these 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 uh, these uh, these uh, these. Uh, uh, models of neurons with the artificial synapse to make neural networks and from them one can do develop large scale brain network like this. So there's a parallel between them. So one could ask that why one would bother about biological networks and, and, and intelligence while these days it seems like lots can be done and almost in many uh, in many tasks near human performance can be achieved. Yeah. So the, the current state of the art in this area is this that one, one can use static data sets, for example, images of, uh, of certain diseases or, or, for example, someone has a stroke. Yeah? And then uh, neural networks can be trained to, to diagnose the type of the stroke and, 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 and all, all of that can be done with as much accuracy as a very trained doctor can do. 
But the, but the, but the point here is this, that these are the things that the doctor would do after a lot of training and experience unconsciously. They don't have to put in a lot of effort to do that. Yeah, and and the current state of the art is this: that with deep uh, deep learning and deep neural networks, one can achieve a uh, very good performance in static environments and static data sets. However, once the things become more complex, for example, uh, a more dynamic, dynamic environment where there is an interaction between individuals, uh, where there is a conscious effort to indulge in, 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 in some intellectual uh, you know, uh, interactions. So, the, uh, so, so these, for example, include reasoning, planning, and so on. So here, deep learning fails. So, so, so current state of the art is this that uh, you know uh, in dynamic environments uh, there's very little one uh, can actually get out of the deep neural networks. Uh, so the so the idea is this that can we actually augment the deep neural network with biological networks and 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 this is important because uh, we know that the brains are billions of years of have gone to the billions of years of, of evolution and the, and the algorithms that they implement they have been optimized by evolution and they they are they are uh, optimal in the sense of both energy efficiency and also the computational efficiency. So, uh, so if we understand how brain does things, it can help us to, to develop better uh, and in, in intelligent machines. Okay, so um, with this, uh, I mean, uh, I will, so that's sort of a motivation that why engineers would be interested in understanding brains because they can help us to develop better uh, better machines, for example. Okay, so let's uh, um, go into a bit more of brain imaging that how actually one can measure brain activity. So here, what I'm showing you is again a picture uh, of, of from 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 uh, it, from, uh, uh, from 19th century. Uh, uh, the physiology of, of mental effort. So you could see that there's a table on which a person is, is lying. And uh, this is a very delicately balanced table, which, which could trip downward either at the head or at the foot if the weight of either end were increased. The, move, the, the movement, emotional or intellectual activity began in the subject, down went the balance at the head end and the consequence of the redistribution of blood in the system. So this is sort of a, what, what's happening here, this is a very well calibrated uh, uh, table. If person starts doing some intellectual activity, more blood goes here huh, and it tilts, yeah? And that's how uh, the brain signals were measured initially. But now this can be done much more sophisticatedly by using these, uh, uh, these, these giant magnets, what we call magnetic resonance imaging or MRI scanners. I think most of you have seen them and they, they are very useful because uh, they, they can give very high quality brain images which are non-invasive. So one can image human brains without any, uh, any risk to their, to their health. And, and the images that we get are, are very high quality and, and lots of them, lots of, uh, lots of things can be done in terms of modeling using them. So these, uh, these MRI scanners can be used to, um, to, to get two different sorts of images. One is what we call a structural images. So, so basically, as the name suggests, what they do is take an image of the brain. And the other one is what we call a functional MRI. And this is, this is used to do study, uh, study the brain function. And they can actually uh, image what the ongoing brain activity yeah, one can think of them as um, as 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 a structural MRI as a single very high resolution image where one can see different brain structures. For example, subcortical structures, uh, white matter, gray matter, uh, cerebral, uh, spinal fluids, and so on and so forth. While the uh, while the uh, functional MRI can be thought of as a, as a movie, as a, as a collection of several. 3D images of neural activity, which are low resolution. Uh, and, and we have to get multiple of these because function is not like 
you know, something which is, which is just a snapshot. It is an ongoing activity. So someone is doing certain intellectual activity or some, some memory task or some motor task, and we can image them while they are doing that task. And that has to be done over a period of time. And, and what happens is this, that, the, that those part of the brain that are used, for example, when someone is doing some cognitive task or a, move, or a movement task, uh, some parts of the brain will, will be working harder than, than others. Working harder means that they will be requiring more energy and that energy comes from the oxygenated blood. So those areas which are working harder, they will be consuming more, uh, more oxygen and the functional MRI, what it does, it, 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 it changes, it, it records the changes in the oxygen level in the blood. So you, it uses this as a proxy for the new activity. So, so remember, uh, functional MRI is not directly measuring neural activity, but it is an indirect measure of neural activity. And that's important uh, from the modeling perspective that I'll talk about a bit later. Okay, so one can then use the functional MRI, for example, as I'm showing you here. For example, one can ask a participant to do, uh, you know, two different conditions. One in what in one they are doing nothing for you know for for a few minutes, and in the in the second part of the experiment they might be doing some brain activity. And then we can average those images and take the difference, and then we we can see there are blobs of activity. For example, in this in this one there is something happening in the visual area, in the back of the brain, where there is a visual uh, cortex and there's an activity here. Um, and, and, and this is, this is uh, all done. I don't, I'm not going into the details of this. Um, uh, they, they, there is a theoretical framework, uh, a theoretical and a statistical framework called a statistical parametric mapping, which, uh, which is developed by the group there where I was affiliated with at UCL. Uh, this is a brain imaging software tool which allows us to, 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 to process uh, functional MRI images and and make uh, you know instances of them from them. Okay, so for example, as I said, uh, so this is an example of a structured image here. One can see uh, the the enlarged ventricles in in people who have schizophrenia, for example. Uh, functional MRI, for example, here if someone is lying, if if when they are lying. If you image the brain, you will see that there are brain areas which are lit up, for example, anterior cingulate cortex or uh, left prefrontal cortex. So these are two examples how these brain imaging model modalities can be used. Uh, as I said, uh, brain is uh, brain has billions of neurons, but what we do is we look at the at the at the at the level of the networks where we have brain regions. Uh, and they interact together to make the networks. For example, a uh, visual network or a sensory motor network or auditory network. Or when someone is talking, thinking about themselves, there's a brain network called default mode network. It gets about itself, uh, about, about the self, uh, internal thoughts, and so on and so forth. Um, and, 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 and these functional brain networks, they have certain organization. They, have, they, they, they work in tandem. Interactive uh, uh, interactions of these brain networks are very really important. Uh, for example, uh, as people get uh, get old, uh, as it's been shown here, when they are younger, uh, within network connectivity is much tighter, and the and the connectivity between networks is is, is faster. But as people old, uh, they, they uh, between network connectivity increases to 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 support the ongoing demands on cognition. So the interaction between these networks and then, uh, of, 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 uh, of various kinds, that's important, for example, uh, for, 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 for healthy cognitive aging of people. Yeah? Um, so I will now go into a bit more uh, details and technical details of uh, how uh, one can measure the, the brain connectivity, and I will introduce a, a statistical and Bayesian framework, what we call dynamic causal modeling. So as I was uh, saying before, uh, brain connectivity can be of uh, three different kinds. So first one is what we call the structural connectivity. And the structural connectivity means uh, the physical presence of, of, of axonal connections. So, so these are uh, populations of neurons here. We have three different neural populations. And they are connected, and they are connected by 
um, what we uh, what we say uh, by physical white uh, white metal fibers, which connects them, and uh, you can think of this as a as as if in a in a in a in a large city like Melbourne, uh, there would be different. Uh, there, there are many different roads. So these are uh, you can consider them as landmarks, uh, the regions as landmarks, and they are connected by uh, by road network. Yeah, and these road, road networks they are usually bidirectional. Yeah. Uh, then one can also think of that that on those roads there would be traffic, yeah, and that traffic is is, is also a function of time. For example, in the morning when people uh, when kids are going to school, people are going to office, there would be a lot more traffic on these networks, and and this is what we say functional connectivity. How different different landmarks or, or brain regions or uh, they they interact with each other, yeah, and functional connectivity can be measured. Can be measured by using those uh, time series that I was showing you for the functional MRI, and we can correlate these time series, for example. So these are just simply the correlations here. Yeah, but by definition, uh, these correlations have no direction. So one can say, okay, uh, if these two brain regions are, are, are highly are positive correlated, for example, if something happens in this one, this the activity in the other one will, will goes up. Yeah, uh, but there is no way to know uh, the, the, the causality or the direction of the information flow. And that's what uh, we, we do with what we call effective connectivity. So effective connectivity is, uh, is, uh, is, as we describe it, as a, as a causal or directed influences between brain regions, that how different parts of the brain influence each other. Yeah, and here the important is also the direction of information flow. Yeah. So effective connectivity uh, by nature is model-based uh, because the activity that we are talking about is at the level of neural interactions. And it cannot be directly measured that I was showing you with the functional MRI, we can only indirectly measure it. So in a sense, this effective connectivity or the influences between neural populations, they are, this is an this is a hidden activity that we will try to infer using functional uh, connectivity or the time series data that we get from MRI. Yeah. So effective connectivity is is, is the is the model based uh, variant of functional connectivity, which is statistical way uh, construct. Okay. So. Um, uh, if I go into this then, uh, and and to describe what I was saying and 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 the and the, um, and, the and the relationship between uh, the functional connectivity and the effective connectivity, which is model based, so consider this 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 for example, which is basically nothing but but simulations. We have done um, uh, uh, simulations of how different brain regions would interact, yeah? And here we have developed generated models. Um, and uh, we have these uh, weights given here. And from this, one can, one can uh, generate time series. So there are three brain regions, three time series. And from these three time series, one can actually calculate correlations between these. So this is what we can actually measure, yeah? In real world. And what I'm trying to show here is this, that uh, if we change the interaction, what's happening at the neuronal level, if we change some of the weights here, what happens is this, that for example, although the, the structure remains the same, the only the weighing is different. What we are saying here is this, for example, this and this correlation goes very low. Yeah. Although very similar structure. Similarly, what I could do, I could change few things here and I could, could, could make this very high positive correlation into very high negative correlation. Or I could have these, uh, these interactions in a way uh, that there is no correlation between them. So what I'm trying to, to say here is this, that the mapping between what's happening uh, in the brain uh, these neural interactions, or what we call the effective connectivity, and what we actually can measure this mapping from from uh, from effective connectivity, and this is what we call causes, to the consequences, which is based on the time series data that we acquire through MRI. This mapping is 
one to is many to one. So that so so they, so this is there's no one to map one mapping between the two, and this is what we call an ill force uh, problem, uh, and and they are everywhere. I mean, in engineering, uh, such problems are many, uh, and one instance I'm showing you here is is when we're trying to uh, model a hidden activity in the brain and trying to understand how this has caused what we have measured. Yeah. Um, so for this, as I said, um, uh, we will we will uh, develop a, a model based approach uh, or a generative model. So I'm what I'm showing here. I'm show, showing you here is is this that there is a brain here. So at, at the center, which we will model as a dynamical system. Yeah. And I, I'm keeping it very general. Uh, this is. Uh, what I'm modeling it here as a first order differential equation, and nobody, yeah, there's, there's a change in brain state X, uh, which is function of, of the brain state at the, at the present time. What is the input? And what is the, the model parameters? Or this is what we call how the different parts of the brain are connected with each other. So theta is the connectivity between neural population, which we cannot directly measure, yeah. Um, so in this situation, what happens is this, that something, uh, and this is what we call a generative model or a forward model. So there is some external stimulus, for example, which goes into the brain. It could be an, a, a visual stimulus or an auditory stimulus, enters the brain, it changes the, this dynamical system, and it generates some output. Yeah, and 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 this would uh, this would uh, these changes would be, for example, in the form of changes in the blood oxygen level, and these will be captured by the MRI. And this is the time series that we have from the MRI, and this we show it as y, yeah, uh, signal y of t. Uh, this function g here is what we call hemodynamics, and and this is uh, uh, this is how the neural activity is um, is uh, coupled. Uh, with the outside world. Uh, and this is what we call the hemodynamic function. Uh, and then from these uh, time series or the MRI data, we can calculate uh, some uh, statistics like correlation. This is what we call functional connectivity. So we consider this connectivity theta as effective connectivity and this as a functional connectivity. Uh, which we can measure, and this is what we call consequences and effective connectivity are the causes. So the, so the main problem that we're trying to solve is this, that in the real world, these arrows will change, right? So what we can measure with MRI is the functional connectivity or what we say the, uh, that the time series data. And what we want to do now is this, that we want to invert our model and, and try to estimate what would have caused the data. Or uh, this is what we call uh, what we're trying to estimate is the is the effective connectivity or the causes. Yeah, and for this model inversion, what we this is what we call a Bayesian model inversion because the whole framework is 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 within a Bayesian framework uh, uh, where each uh, parameter is not a point estimate or uh, rather the full uh, uh, distribution. Uh, we use variational inference or, or, or what we call a, a, a Laplace uh, in uh, uh, Bayesian Laplace, where each more each parameter has a Gaussian or normal distribution. Um, when we when we do uh, this uh, um, uh, this model inversion, what we are doing is this that we are minimizing, we are converting this uh, uh, this problem into an optimization problem uh, by writing down an objective function, uh, which is uh, which is just nothing. But uh, what we are trying to do is to minimize the model evidence. Yeah, uh, and 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 here, uh, for example, uh, when we try to do this. Uh, what we get out are two quantities. One is the posterior density of these model parameters. This is uh, shown here, probability of theta given some data for a given model. Um, and, and what we also get is what we are doing is, is this that we are, we are optimizing this objective function. This is what we call uh, model evidence uh, or, uh, or, or, or a proxy to this what we call a free energy. Free energy is just nothing but a lower bound on the model evidence. Usually what happens is this, that the model evidence is, uh, is, is, a, is a integral, uh, which is very high dimensional. 
and uh, a closed form solutions are not possible. So in that case, what we calculate is a lower bound to this, and this is what we call free energy. And uh, this is what we are trying to minimize. And once we minimize this, we get our model uh, our parameters or the, or the posterior densities over them. And, uh, and these, this is what we call the theta is what we call effective connectivity. So this is a, a framework where um, we are uh, trying to uh, see if we can, um, uh, where we can, um, um, where we can actually, uh, 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 where we can actually measure uh, the hidden activity in the brain. The question that how do you measure U of T? Yeah. So what's going in? So so U of T is just simply uh, in a control experiment. It could be it could be like a visual stimulus. So someone is shown a um, uh, you know uh, 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 a stimulus which is moving. And we can we can you know model that, or uh, it could be a uh, it could be an auditory stimulus, or uh, in in studies where there is no external stimulus, it could be what we call resting state studies. There then the U of T could be the internal uh, uh, thoughts, uh, and proxy for that would be the the neural noise, and we usually model this using uh, uh, using um, uh, what we call uh, uh, as a uh, uh, we, 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 we model this as a, um, um, uh, 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 we, we model this as a uh, power law distribution um, and, 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 and as, a, as a known function, which is random and then its, its parameters can also be, uh, uh, be, be estimated. Uh, so uh, what we, I probably have to go a bit quicker here. Um, what I'm trying to say here is this, that, that as I said, this, this mapping from, from consequences to the causes is, is not one to one, it's one to many, yeah? As I'm showing here that there could be multiple causes which, uh, which could have given you the same data, yeah? So how do we actually we, we find out which model is the best explanation for our data. So when we do our model estimation, what we get is a model evidence and model evidence or the free energy, this is like a ranking for a model. And the model with the highest model evidence is we choose, and this is what we call a Bayesian model comparison. In some situation, there could be many models which are very similar with similar model evidence. And then in that case, we use what we call a Bayesian model average. Um, I would uh, probably go quicker here again. Uh, uh, there is a uh, uh, there is a uh, uh, technique that we have developed, what we call Bayesian model reduction. Uh, this is very useful because, uh, in for example, here uh, these uh, uh, these models could be really big, so so there could be many many parameters. What we could do is this: that we can we can we can uh, we can use Bayesian model reduction to first invert, uh, we can first invert our full model or the fully connected model, and then use uh, uh, basic model reduction to, uh, to rank or get evidence for every nested model which could be within, uh, within that fully connected model. And this is uh, based on using uh, Savitic ratios, um, a very useful device. Uh, I'm not going into details of this, uh, but we use this uh, quite a lot and it makes the inference much faster and efficient. Um, important uh, point here uh, is this that the model evidence or the free energy is a function of the sort of data that we are using. So uh, here I'm, I'm showing free energy as two components, as a, as a compromise between the model accuracy and the model complexity. So free energy, when we, minimum, when we, uh, when we optimize free energy, what we are optimizing is the, is the trade-off between model accuracy and its complexity. And uh, for example here, uh, uh, so for example, uh, on the x-axis I have comp model complexity and on the y-axis have the, I have the model evidence for, for, for a very simple sort of data. And for example, those using functional MRI, uh, they would be the optimum at, at this point here, for example. And when we have more complex data, which is measured by using EEG, there could be, uh, uh, you know, another sweet point where the where we get the model evidence to be max to be maximized. So what I'm just trying to show here is this, that this is a function of of, uh, of uh, model evidence is fu is function of what sort of data we are using and how complicated our models are. 
Um, this uh, slide is about uh, how uh, we can measure different connectivities. Uh, so for example, here, what we, I have here at the top is a DCM. Uh, or a DCM is just nothing. You can think it or think of it as a state space model. Yeah? So you can have, uh, for example, a differential equation about a system of differential equations. Uh, you start here at the top, and this is a basically a generator model. Uh, and then what I'm trying to show here is this, that one can actually uh, drive many different measures of connectivity that exist in the equation, and many of them you would have heard. For example, cost correlation functions or convolution kernels or cost, co uh, 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 cost covariance functions. So these can all be mathematically derived if we, drive, we start with a state and space model like a DCM. For example, on the other side, the uh, uh, gender causality and, 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 and so on and so forth. There are some of them are time domain uh, uh, measure, uh, connectivity measures, and we can do Fourier transforms and then look at the spectral domain, for example, cross the spectral densities and coherence and so on and so forth. So the, the main point is this, that if we start with a state space model, uh, we can fit these models and drive whatever measure we would like to drive. Yeah, these are all second order statistics, and and the, and the, and and these rows are higher, uh, first order. Uh, but if we start, and but important point, another important point is, is that it's a one way street. So you cannot, if we start here without a model based approach, you cannot go back to the causes. Yeah, it's a, it's a one way street. So you have to start at the at the at the top. And then you can do, uh, you can drive whatever measure suits your, your experiment. Okay, so uh, just to uh, quickly finish this, I just wanted to give you an, a quick example that how these complicated models can be used uh, for something uh, to, to, to understand uh, some real world phenomena. For example, in this experiment, what we are doing is, is that understand, trying to understand what happens when people are hallucinating. So here, what we have done is this, that we have given people a certain drug called LSD, which is a, which is a psychoactive drug. When you give this drug, people have, have these subjective experiences like visual hallucination or, or, or ego dissolution and so on and so forth. So what we did, we, we gave them these drugs, we, 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 we measured brain activity using MRI, use our modeling approach, the DCM, to look at the, the interaction between different parts of the brain. And we, we actually, what we find out, well, we, what we found out is this, that there's a part of the brain called thalamus which acts as a filter. So thalamus is a, is a subcortical region which receives all the sensory input, and then it passes it on to the cortex where all the processing, cognitive processing is done. What happens in, under, uh, under LSD uh, is this, that, uh, that this thalamus is letting on a lot more information that it usually does uh, uh, in the normal circumstances. And what happens is this, that the cortex is, going, is, is getting a lot of information. And this, this results in overload uh, of, of, of information in the cortex, and this results in hassle hallucination. So this is a nice example um, that uh, uh, of which shows how one can use these models of brain connectivity to understand neural mechanisms behind certain interesting phenomena or alter the states of consciousness. So um, I think I'm I'm uh, pretty much uh, uh, on time now. Maybe I have just a couple of minutes. So I will uh, quickly uh, go through. Uh, I will change gears and I will move from. Uh, modeling and brain connectivity to something what we call uh, active inference and, and free energy principle. This is a, this is a sort of a very a unified theory of how the biological systems exist. So this is a this is a, a container theory and uh, and which can be used to uh, develop very good uh, uh, agents, uh, artificial agents which can have near biological intelligence. So, uh, so this is uh, this is something I would like to uh, introduce and discuss a little bit. Um, I don't have much time, so I won't be able to go in much details. But what is active inference? So, so for example, I'm giving you an example here that what is the difference between a snowfall and a flock of birds? So, uh, you have snowfall, uh, these flakes of snow which are uh, coming down. And there's a flock of birds. Yeah? 
So the difference between them is this, that the birds can take action. They can take action, and usually they, they, they take these actions and avoid surprises. For example, um, uh, birds can actually, uh, can, can, can make these, uh, these, uh, these flocks and, 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 uh, and they, can same, they can remain in the same place. So they are not distributed or, you know, just like the snowflakes, snow, snowflakes will, yeah? So, so this is basically just nothing but a, but a second law of thermodynamics, uh, which says that, uh, that the thing exists uh, uh, that uh, by by minimizing surprise, or in this case, what we are saying in terms of second level, so second level of thermodynamics, that that they increase the entropy. Yeah, but now um, what is what is entropy? So basically, what we could say that entropy is just nothing but average surprise, as I'm showing here. So this means that uh, that the biological system or biological agents must they must self-organize themselves to minimize um, uh, to, to to minimize um, uh, to minimize the surprise, or in other words, they ensure they occupy a limited number of attracting states. So, so as we, uh, what I'm trying to say is this: that the uh, the biological system, they are they are what we call they are in non-equilibrium steady state. So they have certain stable states. For example, uh, we we have we are usually found in the bed, or we are found in the office, or we are uh, near a coffee machine. So, so they are they are certain states where we are, and then we transit between them. Yeah. And this is, uh, this is uh, uh, how uh, any uh, biological system uh, uh, survives by visiting a, a small number of, of, of active states. So to give, uh, and, and these are just last one or two slides uh, before I finish, um, what, is, what is this active inferences? Active instance is just nothing. Where I'm just uh, trying to show here is this that there is a uh, th there's something happening in the real world, a, 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 a true event. Yeah, uh, there are candles which are burning, and and they have certain state. Yeah, and this is what we call a generative process. One can then one can take then observations. Yeah, our brains can uh, can observe what's happening in the real world. It does have its internal generative model of what the world outside looks like. Yeah, we we take these observations and these observations we uh, are used to update the internal generative model. And then once we have those, we can take actions. We can take actions to change the outside world. Yeah, here I have something. So this is what we call uh, uh, an action perception cycle. So I just wanted to introduce introduce you a few uh, key key ingredients, and then um, I will try to uh, put them together. What I mean by this, uh, there's another uh, uh, a very important concept of Markov blankets. So what are Markov blankets? Markov blankets are, for example, in this case, if 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 we are in certain state A, so so what we say is this, that the mark of blanket is de defined by the parents, the children, and children's other parents. So this is so this is a sort of a blanket around a, a certain uh, you know a state or a certain a certain um, uh, variable. And and the important point is this that we only need to know. What is around this? This uh, what is around A, which is the mark of blanket, and 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 which and, and and once we know this, we don't need to know anything about what is outside because they make it because because uh, the target has become conditionally independent of the rest of the variables. Yeah, and MB is the minimum but most informative set of a of a of a of a target variable. So what it has to do this this notion of Markov blanket with the generative model of the world and internal and, uh, and the internal model of the of the world in the brain. So uh, so what so so what I would say is this that that uh, the brain has a, as I say I was saying it has an internal generative. But don't worry about the maths here. Just try to, uh, to to get the, what I'm trying to explain the basic concept, which is that the brain has an internal generative model of the world, how it looks like. It has certain prior beliefs, yeah? 
And then there's an external world. And there's, as I said, there's a sensory uh, state. Uh, so, so, so one can sense uh, using eyes and ears and other senses. One can sense what's out there. And then based on those sensory data, one can then uh, one can take action on the environment and change it. And this is uh, this goes on. And this is uh, 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 this is circular process, uh, the action perception cycle. And here the mark of blankets comes in because the mark of blankets define this boundary between the internal and the external world. Yeah, and the mark of uh, and the blanketed states comprise the active states and the sensory states, and this sort of a provide a statistical boundaries between uh, between the brain, let's say, and the outside world. Now, how this is related with the free energy and the free energy principle that I was talking about and, this, and the concept of surprise. So what I'm trying to show here is this, that we have sensations. We have uh, we, we sense our brains have the internal generated models. They, they create, they, they do some predictions on the, uh, what, what, what's happening and the, and, 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 the, and the difference between them uh, is what we call the prediction error. And this prediction error can be thought of as a surprise. So what we are trying to do is this, that all the time biological agents trying to, to minimize the prediction error or the surprise. And that's how they, they, they adapt themselves to the, to the outside world. And that's how they survive. And, and this prediction error or the surprise, um, one can relate this to the free energy and this is what we, we uh, so, the, so the whole principle is talking about is this that, that, that the biological systems that they, they survive by minimizing uh, the surprise or the free energy. Uh, one can go on and, 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 and put some maths into this, uh, one can write down uh, some of the uh, mathematical expressions, but I won't go into details of this. One can write down free energy, again, as I introduced before, as a complexity and accuracy, and this is what we are trying to minimize. Uh, one can talk, talk about perception uh, and so on and so forth. Um, so, so just to introduce what the free energy principle is, what is active inference, and, and, and we can use this framework to, to develop much better uh, biological agents, which can do, uh, you know, uh, which may have uh, uh, near biological intelligence, uh, and this is uh, this is it. Uh, I would like to thank uh, several people over the years with whom I have worked and, and, and learned, especially uh, Carl Fiston at UCL, and uh, and also uh, the sponsors of my research. So with that, I thank you, and I have a 